Numbers chapter 13. We're going to begin at verse 25. And we're going to read through verse 33. Numbers 13, 25 through 13. There it is on the screen for those of you online who are watching. And the word of the Lord today from the King James text reads, And they returned from searching of the land after forty days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, meaning Moses, and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. Amen. I want to speak to us for a while today on the topic What are you looking at? Amen. What are you looking at? Praise the name of the Lord. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, Master, Savior, Redeemer, and King, once again, oh God, we come before you. My allergies are giving me quite a battle today. My voice is struggling to remain strong. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost to help me to deliver to God's people the word of the hour. Master, you've given me a message. I know that you've given me a message, for I would not stand in the pulpit and deliver any word except that it be God-given. And Master, I need today the anointing of the Holy Ghost that I might deliver this word in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. Let it go forth in power and divine authority. Let it go beyond the hearing of those that watch and listen and let it find its way to the heart. Help us, Lord, today, everyone, to be receptive to the Word of God. For faith cometh by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. Let our faith be multiplied many times over in response to the hearing of this message today. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' lovely, wonderful, saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the Lord. What are you looking at? I have an illustration for my sermon today. A young man sitting high on a, a high peak overlooking a valley and the river is flowing through the valley. And you can see mountains on either side of the river. What a beautiful scene. And yet there are some who could stand at that very same mark, that identical place where that young man is sitting. And if you were to ask them, what do you see? They would have a very different answer. They wouldn't say, oh, I see beautiful mountains. I see colorful trees. I see a lovely river flowing through the valley. No, they would likely say, I see the potential of falling to my death. I see a high cliff that I could lose my footing and fall from and die. Isn't it interesting how people can be looking at the same identical thing and yet our perspective has so much to do with what we see. I remember when I was young, <clears throat> I heard older people often talking about if you change your perspective, if you change how you look at things, it is amazing how much better your life can be. And when I was young, I thought they were foolish. When I was young, I thought the old timers were talking gibberish and, and, and it was just foolishness what they had to say. And yet as I got older, and it didn't take a whole lot of time, but as I got older, I began to realize that these people knew good and well what they were talking about. Half of the trouble in our lives today is not associated with the reality of what we face so much as it is in the attitude with which we face it. So much of the difficulty in our lives, the struggle in our lives, has more to do with how we look at things than how those things genuinely look. You know, we live in a world today, the internet has made it possible for every cockamamie, every lunatic uh, conspiracy theory and every kind of of strange tale uh, to gain legs and to find its way around the world and amazingly enough there is some knucklehead somewhere who is willing to believe just about any crazy story you can tell especially if it's about somebody they don't like Oh, if it's about the other political party, if it's about the other guys, I have no problem believing that they're part of a, of a cabal that, uh, that slaughters children and offers them in sacrifice and has sexual relationships with children. I don't find it difficult to believe this hallelujah glory to God because after all it's the other guy. It's the people I hate. It's the people I don't like and that I disagree with and therefore anything you tell me I'll believe about them and anything you tell me about the government and anything you tell me about the world we live in today I'll believe and 
folks, it is a sad state of affairs that so many people in our nation today are living miserable, horrible, depressing lives not because the reality is so bad, but because they have chosen a mindset, they have chosen a perspective that causes them to see everything through the darkest, muddiest glasses. And yet if these people could just open their eyes and wash their glasses off and look at things realistically, they'd realize realistically things are nowhere near as bad as they've been made to believe they are. You know, there's a reason why the Word of God teaches whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are right. Think on these things. There's a reason the Word of God teaches this. There's a reason the Word of God tells us this. Because as Christians, we're supposed to be people of faith. We're supposed to be people who walk by faith and not by sight. And therefore, God says, your perspective ought always to be a positive perspective. Your perspective ought always to be hopeful. Your perspective ought always to be um, optimistic. My grandmother used to drive me insane when I was young. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Here she was, a Pentecostal lady, full of the Holy Ghost, and yet her kids would come to her. Uh, I mean, her adult children would come to her, and maybe they had an idea for a business, or maybe they had an idea for something they were wanting to do. And my grandmother was the queen of pessimism. She could throw more but what ifs at you than you can handle. She could see the possibility for failure. She could see the possibility for trouble uh, everywhere. And my, she would discourage my poor uncles and aunts out of their minds with all her pessimistic foolishness. And I was probably one of the only people in my family, if you all think I'm hard on church folk, if you think I'm hard on you, so to speak, you know, having a habit of speaking my mind. Well, let me tell you, uh, I'm probably one of the only people in my family that would ever look my grandmother in the eye and tell her the truth. Everybody else was afraid of her. Everybody else didn't want to get her upset at him. I said, I could care less. I looked at her one day. I said, Grandma, for a person who's supposed to be Holy Ghost baptized and full of the power of God, you are the most faithless thing I've ever looked at in my life. Of course, she looked at me like a deer in the headlights. What do you mean? I'm not faithless. I'm just being realistic. I said, no, you're not being realistic. You're being faithless. I remember my grandfather telling the story when I was young, and I heard him tell the same story many, many times throughout the course of my life, so I know that this experience bothered him. It troubled him. His entire life it bothered him. He worked at a farm for a man for several years when he and my grandmother first married. And he worked on this farm with this man. And this man decided he and his wife were going to retire. And they were going to leave farming. And they were going to go down to Florida or something, you know. And uh, But he loved my grandfather. He thought the world of my grandfather. And he made my grandfather an offer, as the old saying goes, that was too good to refuse. And he told my grandfather, he said, Don, I want to sell you my farm. 
and I know that you're young and you don't have the credit and you probably couldn't go to the bank to get the money. He said, but I know your character. I know what kind of a man you are. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll finance it for you. All you've got to do is make payments. Now, obviously, this man probably had long since paid his farm off, you know. So if he were retired and getting this income consistently, it would be a huge help to him, you know. So that's how he figured he'd work it out. And he offered my grandfather this farm for payments. Now, mind you, this farm, not only did it have barns and buildings like that, but it had two houses on it. It had one single family house, and it had another two family house. So my grandfather and his young family could live in the main house and they still would have had a two-family house to rent out. And both of those rents would have gone toward paying his mortgage. Well, my grandfather was excited. He was thrilled. He saw the possibility for having a good life and, and really making out well and owning a couple hundreds of, of acres of land and two houses and, you know, and, and everything was just uh, such a good opportunity for him. And he went to my grandmother and as only my grandmother could do, well, what if, what if we couldn't rent out those apartments in that house? What if we couldn't afford the mortgage? What if we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that? What if, what if, and all her faithlessness just poured out of her like it did. My grandfather said, my grandmother was such a worry ward over it that he opted not to do it. He said, I couldn't do it if she wasn't behind me, if she wasn't going to support the idea, so I opted not to do it. He said, so another man came along and bought that farm, and he said, about 10 years later, some big company came that wanted that land so they could put their national headquarters for their company on that property. And the man who bought it, instead of my grandfather, wound up making a couple million dollars. A couple of million dollars. We're talking back in the late 1950s, folks. And my grandfather sat there and he said, I could have been a millionaire. I could have been sitting here a millionaire. But oh no, your grandmother, bless God, no, no, can't do this. What if that? What if this? What if that? Oh, but she called herself being realistic. Realistic, my eyeball. Realistically, People do exactly what my grandfather wanted to do every day. They buy properties. They have rental properties. They rent those properties out. You know what I'm saying? Everything my grandfather wanted to do, the next guy did. The only difference is when it comes time to answer an offer from a major corporation to buy that land. My grandfather wasn't the one who held the deed. So he wasn't about to make millions on the deal. My grandfather's brother, also Pentecostal, married to a Pentecostal woman. My Uncle Bob, throughout the course of his marriage, he wanted to buy a number of rental houses he wanted to invest in real estate. He went to his wife and he said, uh, there's a house over here that I think would be a good investment and we could buy it and rent it out and it would be a good investment. And my Aunt Betty said, okay, Bob, whatever you want to do. If you think we can do it, then that's fine. Let's do it. 
And Malibu Bob bought one property. After a while, he bought a second property. After a while, he bought another property. By the time he was done, he owned about five or six different houses. He wound up very well off doing very well for himself. And then the house he and my Betty lived in, a beautiful home on a, a, a pretty good parcel. I forget how many acres they had, but a pretty good, not near hundreds, but several. And the corporation that he had worked for, the factory he had worked for in Naugatuck, Connecticut for many years, they came and they said, we'd like to buy your property from you because we want to put our corporate headquarters here in Middlebury, Connecticut. And Uncle Bob said, well, he said, I... I'd love to do that. He said, but my wife and I love this house, and we really don't want to move out of this house. And they said, well, honestly, Bob, we can, what we want to do is on the back acreage, we don't really need to touch. We can kind of portion off, say, uh, half an acre or an acre, and what we'll do is we'll give you the right to live there for the remainder of your natural lives. We'll buy it from you, but at the same time, you can live it. Can you imagine? And Uncle Bob said, well, that sounds reasonable. That sounds fair. We'll do that. So they did it. They gave him a whole bunch of money. Boy, I mean, he, a lot of money. And here he was already doing pretty well for himself. Now he's really sitting large. Then a few years later, they came along and said, well, Bob, you know what? We thought we weren't going to need this property over here where the house is and all, but now we think maybe we kind of do. And would it be possible for us to go ahead and buy out the option we gave you for lifetime residence? And he and Aunt Betty talked about it, and they owned a nice rental. One of their rental homes was a great, big, beautiful house. And uh, they had actually rented it to a church, believe it or not. The house was so huge that a church was able to use it. And uh, it was vacant. The church had moved out, and Bob said to Aunt Betty, he said, well, what do you think? Would you mind if we moved over to that house, and, and we went ahead and let them have this one, and they're offering me a million dollars or whatever it was. And uh, Aunt Betty said, well, Bob, whatever you think, Bob, you know, you're the husband, whatever you want. If that's what you want to do. Let's do it. So they did it. So here my grandfather got to sit his whole life watching his younger brother achieve great success and accumulate great wealth just like himself his younger brother had a Pentecostal wife the only difference was the perspective the perspective that my grandmother came from and the perspective that my Aunt Betty came from they were worlds apart Betty didn't see a demon behind every tree. She wasn't looking for trouble. She wasn't anticipating the worst all the time. She said, well, whatever happens, we'll figure out a way to get through it. One way or the other, it's either going to be a success or it's going to be a failure. But it doesn't matter either way because it's not like we couldn't sell the house as Bob was buying or, you know, we couldn't do whatever. She said, hey, the man had a vision. He had a dream. He wanted to do something. He wanted to achieve something and accomplish something and acquire something. Who was I to stand in his way? I'm his wife. I'll stand behind him. Perspective, folks, changed the outcome for my grandfather and the outcome for my uncle. One wound up very successful, died very wealthy. My Aunt Betty's still living. She's in her 90s now. I think she's about 94 at this point or so. Still living. Last I knew, she was going strong. 
and she's living large. She's got a good life. She hadn't got a worry or a care in the universe. Nothing to worry about because her husband had been able to realize his vision and realize his goals and do what he wanted to do because he had a supportive wife who didn't constantly preach negativity and fear and doubt and pessimism. I'm going to tell you today from the Holy Ghost, there are some of you listening under the sound of my voice today, and some of y'all, your whole life is going to be screwed up like crazy. Your whole life, you're going to be miserable and unhappy. Oh, Pastor, you're not supposed to say that. Why don't you know T.D. Jakes never makes comments like that? Why? TV preachers don't talk like that. Yeah, I know. They're too busy preaching peaches and cream and telling you foolishness that's never going to happen for you because you're so full of pessimism and negativity and fearfulness that you'll never be able, never be able to occupy the land that God has established for you. God can have great plans for you, my friend. The Lord can have marvelous plans for you. And if your perspective is wrong, then you're never going to be able to realize that plan. Doesn't matter how great, it doesn't matter how wonderful, it doesn't matter how prosperous, it doesn't matter how blessed God may want to make you, you're never going to see it. Because what you see when you look out from that high point is danger. What you see when you look out from that high point is trouble. What you see from that high point is the potential of your death. Whereas the other guy sees unlimited opportunity. He sees beauty. He sees grandeur. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? What are you looking at? Moses sent out 12 spies. One man from each of the tribes of Israel. He sent them into the land of Canaan. The land that God had promised the children of Israel. When he brought them 40 years earlier out of Egypt's bondage. They had arrived at the border. Unfortunately, Moses would not be able to pass through. He would not be able to live in the land of promise. His journey ended at the border. His journey ended once he got the people of God to their destination. But it was not God's plan that he should then lead the children of Israel into that land so that they could conquer it and possess it. And there was a reason for this, children. Oh, I want you to hear me today. Everything God does, everything the Lord does, He does for a reason. And I'm here to tell you today that... The, Moses leading the people of God to the land of promise, but not leading them in was prophetic in that it explained to us how that the law could only bring us to a point. But what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, condemned sin in the flesh. What Moses couldn't do as a representative of the law, Joshua did. Joshua, one of the only men, two men who came back with a positive report, with a report filled with faith, with a report filled with optimism. Joshua was the one whom God would anoint to lead the children of Israel 
into the land of promise. And the name Joshua is the Hebrew name Jesus. Hallelujah. What the law could not do, Jesus could. Hallelujah. The law can't get you into heaven, but Jesus can. Glory to God. There's a reason why Moses was not permitted to go into the land of promise. No, Moses, you represent the law. And the law can only get you so far. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Then you need Joshua. Then you need Yeshua, the Hebrew name Joshua, Yeshua. Then you need Yeshua to bring you the rest of the way in. Glory to the Lamb of God. Out of 12 spies, 12 men from the 12 tribes sent into the land of promise. 10 came back talking about how big and powerful the cities were and how big and, and muscle bound the men were of that land. And oh, it was not possible that we should be able to take that land and possess it. Oh, God's led us here. But now we are in a position uh, to not be able to move forward and not be able to go any further 40 years worth of wandering and God brought us to a dead end but Joshua and Caleb said dead end my eyeball said we are well able to go up and take this country as we sang this song this morning we are able to go up and take this country to possess the land from Jordan to the sea while the giants may be there our way to hinder our God will give the victory the same God who brought us through the Red Sea parting the waters so that we could cross upon dry land the same God who rained down manna from heaven the same God who caused quail to fall in the midst of our camp so that we might eat meat the same God who caused water to pour forth from a rock in the wilderness so that we not die of thirst the same same God who brought us here by his power, by his miracles, by his might is able to bring us into the land so that we might possess it. Hallelujah to God. There's an old song that says, he didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't pick us up to let us down. Oh, I want to tell you today, children, God has big plans. God may have some marvelous plans for you. And you may get to the point where you're standing right at the border, where you're standing just outside the realization of everything you ever wanted, everything you ever dreamed of, everything God ever promised you. But if your perspective is wrong, then honey, guess what? You will not be able to possess the land. God only operates through faith. God only operates in faith. God cannot, will not ever act against your belief system. What do you mean by that, Pastor? I mean, if you can't believe Him for it, He ain't going to give it to you anyway. Romans 1.17 
For herein is the righteousness, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. In Hebrews 10.38, now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, we are reminded, for we walk by faith, not by sight. As the spies who had gone into the land of promise in 40 days later returned to Israel and brought their report to Moses and delivered it to him before the entire congregation of Israel. All the people of Israel stood and listened as these spies delivered their report to Moses. Now listen, you got ten talking pessimism and unbelief and lack of faith. You only got two, 20% of the spies talking faith and optimism. And here's the response of the congregation of Israel. Numbers 14, the next chapter from what we have just read today. Verses 1 through 9, Numbers 14. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Forty years! To get to the border of Canaan land. And they're still faithless, feckless fools wanting to turn around and go back to Egypt, tail tucked between their legs. Oh, I'm going to tell you, too many Christians live their lives like this. They stand at the edge of promise, they stand at the edge of victory. But what are they looking at? They're looking at the obstacles. They're looking at those things which would hinder them. Forgetting that God brought you through a whole bunch of obstacles. <laughs> the Lord brought you through a whole bunch of things that would hinder you. If God did, who's to say God can't? Hallelujah. There's an old song that says, I believe he... Uh, is what others just think he was. Woo, glory. What they suppose he did. I know he still does. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Another old song said, he'll do it again, he'll do it again. If you'll just take a look at where you are now and where you have been, hasn't he always come through for you. He's the same now as then. Oh, you may not know how. You may not know when. But he'll do it again. Hallelujah. Oh, it's about perspective. It's about what you see when you look at the promise. When you look at the blessing. When you look at the possibility. When you look at the miracle. Are you focused on what hinders you? Or are you focused on what God has promised? If God brought them out of the land of Egypt with the promise that they would possess this land, then my God have mercy. Why in the world should they question 
question whether or not they were able to possess that which God had promised them. Numbers 14 verse 5, Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. Listen, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Hallelujah. If he delight in us, glory to God, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give thee the word of God promises, the desire of thine heart. Hallelujah. But then in verse 9, Joshua said, Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the the people of the land for they are bred for us their defense is departed from them and the Lord is with us fear them not hallelujah that's what Joshua said that's what the man who would replace Moses said got news for you today that's what Jesus says to you and I today I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me hallelujah quit looking at everything in terms of pessimism quit looking at everything faithlessly quit looking at everything negatively look at God hasn't brought you to this point to leave you high and dry. Hallelujah. No. No. Remember what he did for you yesterday. Remember what he's done for you in the past. There is not a single thing God's ever done that he is not capable yet of doing today. Jesus said, greater works than these he said shall they do which come after me because I go unto the Father he said you think the miracles you've seen me perform in the flesh are something he said just wait until I ascend into heaven and return by my spirit and start working through my church I'm going to do bigger things by my spirit than I ever did in the flesh the word of God tells us it's not by might it's not not by power, it's by my spirit, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, when God needs to do something big, he doesn't need might. He doesn't need power. All he needs is his presence. You wonder why demons flee. We go into a home and perform an expulsion. And I anoint the walls and I invite the presence of God into every nook and cranny, every closet, every corner of that home. And you wonder why this works. I'll tell you why it works. Because God doesn't have to be powerful. All God has to do is be present. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Joshua reminded the people of God, Rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us, their defense is departed from them. Listen, and the Lord is with us. We have his presence. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. People don't understand when you're in 
deliverance ministry as I've been engaged in for many years and I tell people on our website and stuff, come to church. You need deliverance, come to church. Come to church. Oh, they think we're only saying that because we're trying to grow our church. We're trying to make them members. Oh, no, 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 honey. Wrong. You are more wrong than you know. No. No. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. I can feel them in the atmosphere. The presence of the Lord is here. When you come into the presence of the Lord, if you're vexed by a devil, if you're tormented by a devil, if you're possessed of a devil, I'm going to tell you something. The presence of God will dislodge that vexation. The presence of God will dislodge that... Uh, uh, possession. The presence of God is powerful. Demons don't like to be in the presence of God. Every time Jesus walked up to a demoniac, they started to cry out, What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus? I'm going to tell you something. And, and you can think of it however way you want to think of it. I don't much care. I've lived it. I told you I knew a guy years ago. I talked about this in Bible study a couple weeks ago. I knew a man in the community who was part of a, uh, a demonic African cult religion that went back thousands of years. And this cult, they'd go out in the woods and wait on a demon to occupy them. This was part of their ritual. This was part of their belief system. One day, he and I were on a train together <laughs> in New York City, subway train. I've had this happen. I, I can't really count how many times, but it's been several times this has happened. Different people every time. We're sitting on the train. All of a sudden, this homeless woman comes on the train. She comes through the cars, you know, the doors that connect the cars. She comes in and she looks at me, and when she sees me, she let out a scream like you'd have thought somebody was knifing her. Literally. People on the train about scared them out of their mind. They didn't know what was going on. And she looked at me and she screamed, Stay away from me! Stay away from me! I know who you are! I know who you are! Stay away from me! Don't come near me! My little demon-worshiping friend was scared out of his mind. He said to me, I have been riding this train for years and that same woman has, I've seen her on this train I don't know how many times and not once have I ever seen her act like that. I have not once ever seen her react to anybody like that. I didn't even talk to her. I didn't say a word to her. She just looked at me and immediately fell back screaming. <laughs> like somebody was knifing her to death. Stay away from me. I know who you are. Stay away from me. Honey, I've been there many, many times. I've had demoniacs do that on several occasions. When on the street in New York City, I had it happen one time. And I'm here to tell you, it's not because I'm special. It's not because I'm so holy I can walk on water. It's not because I possess some power or some, uh, you know, skill or magic. No, no. I'm going to tell you what it is. It's the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, we sing the old song, I got the Holy Ghost down in my soul. Just like the Bible says. And sweetheart, when you're walking in the presence and power of the Holy Holy Ghost demons know you by name. They know who you are and you scare them to death. Paul, I know. Jesus, I know, but who are you? Oh, they know. They know who the people are. 
that are full of the presence and power of God. And the people of God scare them to death. Honey, if demoniacs are afraid of me without me ever looking at them or speaking their name or talking to them, then why in the world should I be afraid of any circumstance or any situation that God has led me to? Why should I not be able to believe God to lead me into the land that He's led me unto? Almost done today. Got to tell you folks, got too many Christians. They're like that 80% of the spies. They go in, they look around, they come back, and all they saw were the obstacles. All they saw were troubles. Their whole viewpoint is tainted by pessimism and faithlessness. But thank God for that 20%. You know why God calls people to preach? Because I'm going to tell you something. Because 80% of the people in the church, if, if they were up there leading the church, the church would never go nowhere. Would never do nothing. Would never be nothing. Would never accomplish nothing. My grandmother's sister, my great aunt, she's another one who was wonderful full of pessimism and negativity and faithlessness. My grandmother and she were peas in the pod. Here she was down in Texas, part of the great Riverside Church of God. Brother Gillum for years wanted the church on some property uh, behind the church. And he wanted to build a big youth center there so young people could come and play basketball and have programs for the young people in the church because as a holiness church they didn't believe in worldly amusements you know so they he wanted to give them a place where they could go and they could have some things to do and they could fellowship and and have some good clean uh christian fellowship and what have you and my aunt telling me one day about it and bless God I don't see the need for the church be wasting money on something like that bless God you know what I mean? and yet her biggest gripe was when her son was growing up in the church that uh uh, she felt like they didn't embrace him the way that other young people were embraced. And, you know, they, my, that woman scared everybody. I'm gonna, anybody who knew anything about her knew she was hypersensitive, got offended at everything, and, you know, and so people were kind of afraid to deal with her. They, they kind of kept their distance because she was such a lunatic. And unfortunately, of course, that affected her kids as well, you know. And, but now here's Brother Gillum trying to do something that her son would have benefited from. Might have gotten him in with the crowd. Might have gotten him in because he was great at sports, you know. He might have gotten in with the kids playing basketball. He might have gotten in with the kids playing ping pong or pool or whatever they were going to have there, you know. Oh, but no, my aunt, full of pessimism and negativity. And unfortunately, there must have been others like her in the church. I don't know because Brother Gillum never was able to get that done told you before, this pastor, I don't talk about anything very long. I, I can't stand it. I hate people who talk. I'm going to tell you people out there who talk support for this ministry and you talk support for us. You know what? Choke on your talk. I'm so fed up with talk. I, I have no time for talk. You watch the way this preacher lives. You watch the way this preacher operates and you'll see. I'm a doer, not a talker. And I can't stand talkers. If you're not going to get off your lazy rear end and do something, then shut up. Don't even tell me you're watching our services online. Last thing in the world I need is somebody who lives here in Huntsville who could be here 
encouraging the pastor who could be here trying to help us realize our vision and get somewhere. Oh, but no, they sit at home in their bathrobe and their slippers and watch us online and then send me messages about how blessed they are watching and how much they enjoy our services online. Sweetheart, keep it to yourself. I don't need to hear that crap. I don't need to hear that foolishness. This preacher's got a vision. The vision that God's given me, the church that we could have, would blow this city right off its rocker. Would probably blow a hole through the nation and blow people's minds if they saw a church like what the, the vision that God has given me. I don't need people sitting at home who don't invest nothing. You know, Amy, you know why most people like to sit at home and watch our services online instead of coming? Because they don't want to feel the least bit obligated to have to give a penny to help support us either. And sitting at home watching online, they can feel perfectly justified in not giving a nickel to help this ministry realize its goals. But then thank God for people like Amy, who for years and years and years has been faithful, not just occasional, faithful in her support to a fault. I'm going to tell you, if it wasn't for people like her, I'd, I'd probably have a nervous breakdown and drop dead because I get so tired. The best we can ever get is people who talk a good game. She doesn't live locally. She's not able to be part of our church locally. But you know what? She believes in our vision. She believes in our message. She believes in our objectives. And she supports it. She puts her money, as the old saying goes, where her mouth is. I want to tell you today, folks, I'm going to close this message with this word. Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Without faith, folks, you're just fooling yourself if you think you're living a life that's pleasing in the sight of God. Without faith, no. It's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. If you're going to come to God, first of all, you've got to believe God exists, of course. But there's another little caveat. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice Paul did not say he's a punisher of those who don't seek him. No. If you're going to come to God, if you're going to walk in relationship with God, there are two things you've got to believe. A, you've got to believe God exists. Number two, you've got to believe that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Joshua and Caleb got it. They understood it. They said, hey, listen, if the Lord delight in us, He's going to give us this. If we'll diligently seek Him, if we'll diligently worship Him, if we'll diligently serve Him, He's going to give this to us. He promised us this, and He didn't lead us this far to leave us high and dry. Oh, children, my question for you this afternoon is, what are you looking at? When you look at your future, when you look at the possibilities that lie ahead of you, when you look at the promises of God that He has made to you for your life, what do you see? Do you see the possibilities? Are you looking through glasses of faith 
and optimism or do you see the enemy do you see the obstacles through spectacles of pessimism and faithlessness I hope you're looking through glasses of faith because without faith it is a it is impossible to please him hallelujah what are you looking at amen <laughs>